Welcome to the Asbestos Knowledge Empire. What does asbestos management mean to you? I used to really struggle with the asbestos management at my site, but now it's a breeze. It used to be really expensive. I was paying loads, but now I've got my asbestos power team in place. It's so much easier. Asbestos could be a pain in the ass if not handled right. We had to stop the job because asbestos was discovered. Now we don't have that problem. Asbestos management is easier than you think. Asbestos management. Be proactive, not reactive. Think about asbestos first, not last. And now your hosts, best-selling authors and asbestos experts, Ian Stone and Neil Munro. Welcome to the Asbestos Knowledge Empire. I'm Ian Stone. I'm Neil Munro. So today we're talking about removing non-asbestos that's over asbestos material. So in this example, we're going to talk about removal of non-asbestos carpet, just normal carpet or lino that's been laid over the top of uh, old asbestos vinyl tiles, old asbestos bitumen, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's quite quite prevalent, isn't it, in sort of authority buildings, isn't it? Yeah, so offices, schools. Schools, schools are a big one, isn't it? Because yes. um, schools quite rapidly sort of change their, their flooring, don't they? They do. Not normally once every couple of years, really. There's, there's obviously, there's a lot of footfall going through a lot of these areas. Yeah. And children don't really treat it with a lot of care, do they? No, they don't. So it does get trampled upon. Yeah. And and, he, and schools, obviously, they, you know, there's still lots of schools that contain asbestos. I think it's estimated kind of about 78% of schools in England still contain asbestos. And one of the, the, the kind of um, asbestos products that is prevalent in schools is um, asbestos flooring and more in particular the asbestos bitumen adhesive that sticks to the, the tiles or yeah. the former tiles down to the floor a lot of that is still left in schools it is i mean even when you've had the asbestos flooring removed the asbestos vinyl removed because the bitumen is such a pain in the ass to get it up yeah and it's a, a big expense on top of just the removal of the vinyl tiles itself yeah quite often it's left down um, sometimes it's just laid new floorings laid directly over the top other times it's screeding over isn't it yeah I'd say more particularly it's, it's only been in the last kind of I don't know five years that contractors you know the, the technology's come on hasn't it and yeah. the, the removal the removal process has kind of advanced in the last sort of five years so, and they've got the machines they're a bit cheaper to obviously get hold of um, and buy uh, or, or rent so bitumen removal has kind of um, come a bit more about and getting rid of it than the last sort of like 20 years, yeah. I'd say. So we're still left with that problem where, you know, lots of... And, and this is where it gets a bit confusing for duty holders because they think they've had the floors removed because yeah. they've paid for a special removal of that floor before. However, it was kind of only a half job. Yeah. Um, so it's leaving the uh, asbestos bitumen still left on the floors. Definitely. It, it is, like you say, it is that kind of legacy issue. Yeah. And the, the reason it was left, it's not because the contractors were being lazy or couldn't be bothered or whatever. It was just to, to actually remove the bitumen, um, you either had to use chemicals, which generated their own issues and risks from a cost risk assessment point yeah. of view. Um, and it was just horrible work. Like the bitumen adhesive, it's black, sticky adhesive. So you'd use a solvent-based uh, remover, and then you'd still have to scrape it up. But even when you've kind of removed it, you're still left with stains yeah, smeared, on the floor. Smeared it all over the yeah, place. And that's what it was. It was horrible. And then the only other way to remove it is to use machines. However, like you just said, like the, the machines weren't as kind of readily available as what they... Yeah, they weren't geared up to... It. The dust extraction really. No. It, was, it was more grinders. Yeah, you can grind the floor. You can grind but... the floor, but then you're still creating that asbestos oh, risk massive, by yeah. disturbing asbestos. And it was yeah. like you say, there was no extractor on the equipment, so it just create dust everywhere. Nowadays, that some of the machines do have a better uh, dust extraction. And I'm not saying it's perfect, yeah, and it's nowhere near perfect to be honest, because. Um, there is still dust that's generated. Yeah. And for, for any flooring works where you are uh, grinding and removing the bitumen, you still need kind of bigger control measures than you would perhaps think for non-licensed works. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, you for standard vinyl removal, it's, it's kind of done in a suitably controlled area, isn't it? It's kind of barriers, um, you know, exclusion zones while they're removing, whereas the grinding, really, you've got to have a partial enclosure to yes. do that work, haven't you? Yeah, definitely. And you definitely want, you know, negative, you know, pressure units 
given a bit of dust extraction from the area. Yeah. So it's kind of, you know, you come in on a bit of advanced non-licensed removal, really. It is, definitely. And, and that's, that's why I still think there will be a bit of a legacy going forward anyway, because of all those things you've just said, that obviously adds a lot of cost and time onto the project. Oh, massive. Because to, to grind the floor, it, you, you don't ever grind the floor in one go and it's all done. Yeah. It, it normally takes sort of two, three, four goes at a floor to, to get rid of the bitumen. Yeah, and you've always got the, the issue around the skirtings, haven't you? Exactly. Around the that. walls, yeah. because the actual machine doesn't go right flush, No. does it? So you end up, you know, a lovely sort of... <laughs> screeded floor now with no bitumen on it with a, a black line lying all the way yeah, around the, the edge don't it's you? a two inch strip that runs around the edge yeah. which again the only way to get it up is using chemicals or um with operatives using hand tools yeah and scraping it up which again that's a massive massive task yeah um to to, to remove it properly i have seen like in some occasions and obviously it's not possible is um cutting the the bottom of the floor, yes. That, sorry, the bottom of the walls out, yeah. so I can get the grinder close enough to it, yeah. uh, and then chopping in and, and filling in the walls again, which again is massive a, is time, massive, massive expense. Exactly that. <laughs> so yes, it is a, a complicated, a bit of a ball-like process getting rid of asbestos bitumen adhesive on the floors, isn't it? It is, and so I mean, in this example, I understand where people have frustrations when, in, in their own mind, they think, "Well, look, we're, we're, we're just removing the non-asbestos carpet." And we're putting a new carpet down. What's the problem? Well, the, the problem is, is that the asbestos vinyl and adhesive, it's, it's been down for years. It's solid. Um, and when the new carpet has been laid over the top, the carpet fitters, they always use the, the spray adhesive. And then what you've got the problem of, when you're lifting that carpet or the carpet tiles, um, you've got old asbestos vinyl tiles and bitumen adhesive that's stuck to the back of the carpet. So therefore, you're, you've now got a, a non-asbestos item, which is the new carpet, um, that becomes asbestos because it's got asbestos stuck to it. Yeah. And that's the problem. And I'll, I'll be honest, I don't think I've ever done a project um, where vinyl and adhesive hasn't come up with the new flooring over the top. No, never. It never. just it doesn't happen, does it? And, no. and that's the problem with it, that... You're kind of then moving away from just just removing carpet to well, no, it's actually asbestos works. Yeah, one hundred percent. If you've got asbestos bitumen adhesive on the floor, and you've then um, applied a non-asbestos carpet vinyl, which essentially has to be re-glued onto the bitumen adhesive. Yeah. When you pull that up, you're you're pulling up, you know. Not just the, the non-asbestos glue, but the bitumen adhesive, probably a bit of the screed, and it all gets stuck to the bottom, you know, the, the bottom of the, uh, the carpet tiles or vinyl or whatever it is you, you're using. I was going to say that as well, yeah, because sometimes, sometimes you're right, it's, it is screeded over. But again, there's screed, it's, it's a funny thing. Sometimes it sets well, yeah. and a lot of the time it doesn't. And you, you end up again, like you're lifting it, and the screed starts coming up. Yeah, Which, I think, yeah. I think what what essentially happens if because sometimes you know when, when uh, carpet fitters or, or flooring fitters come in, they if the, the floors are not level, they'll screed over, won't they? So yeah. sometimes, yeah, the bitumen adhesive has been screeded over. Now, if that is a solid floor and a, uh, a solid finish, that's okay. And if the carpet tiles come up without lifting the screed, that's okay. You know, you're not essentially working on the best product. No. However. What tends to happen, the the glue that is from the carpet to the new screed is generally a stronger bond than the screed to the bitumen adhesive. Yes. So what happens is, as the carpet tiles are pulled up, the screed lifts and then the, the bitumen adhesive is exposed and that then is stuck onto the bottom of the carpet tiles as well. Yeah, and, and like you say, the, the reason they put the screed down, it's to, it's to level the floor, it's floor levelling compound. Um, so you, generally speaking, you won't find an entire floor um, that's fully screened over. By yeah. the time you've lifted all that carpet, you'll yeah. see sections where you see brand new screed, mm -hmm. but then next to it, the, the same level sits the old asbestos vinyl. Yeah, because that that was the the bit they needed to level up. So again, like you, you can go and have a look and, and have a go at lifting some lift a couple of tiles. Oh, yeah, I've lifted a couple of tiles. Yeah, yeah, they were fine. But when you've done the entire job. Uh, you'll realise where the kind of real pain in the ass points are. And a lot of the time it's on 
like the main thoroughfares through a through a building. So in the corridor, it's the centre of the corridor, usually really welded down. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then <laughs> other areas like where, like in a school, for instance, where you've got kids that play um, basketball and indoor games, and so in the gyms. You've got a lot of heavy kind of thudding going on. Yeah. And again, that makes the, the the adhesive just super strong in those areas. Yeah. That's another good point because sometimes the adhesive of all the floor coverings, so the original bitumen adhesive, the, the new carpet tile adhesive, sometimes because of that um, compaction, you know, that, that walking on it, it makes it solid. Yeah, and really you solid. you can't even lift it up no. without mechanical equipment. Exactly, because a lot of the time floor tiles and the carpet tiles are removed with hand scrapers, like yeah. large broom-sized scrapers with a blade on the end. Yeah, um, if you're lucky. If you're lucky, <laughs> If you're yeah. very lucky. And, and the guys basically go backwards, forwards, just chipping away at them, um, hopefully lifting them up. But yeah. you're right, in, in those areas... They, but it becomes impossible and you can't physically do it with hand tools and then you need to use floor breakers and kangos and things like that to actually remove yeah. that section. Yeah. You know, I've seen some flooring, some asbestos removal works having to use, you know, a, a mechanical drill yeah. to actually, you know, lift up these areas of tiles, which are so which, It sounds ridiculous. Yeah. Because right? it's just a bit of... Just a bit, bit of carpet bit, and a bit, bit of a bit of a daisy yeah. and a, a bit of carpet and that's it. But it honestly, it just gets that much kind of welded up. Yeah, um, if you if you speak to asbestos contractors, licensed ones, yeah, they will rather most of them will rather do uh, license you know, license work. spray coating ARB pipe insulation than asbestos vinyl tiles. Yes, because you never know what you're going to come across. No, and it's always blister. Causing works. It is no, it's, it's hard work. It is hard work, and again, that's that's why there is such a a cost involved and a time scale involved with it. That's that's the problem with it, and that's where I, I think generally a lot of clients don't see the issue because in the mind they're like, oh no, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. But in reality, there's a lot of stuff that has to go into asbestos works. Yeah, and like yeah, we'll, we'll just run through it now, really. So I suppose first and foremost, before you do a project. You need to know if you're going to disturb asbestos. So the only way to do that is to have the area surveyed. Yep. So in, in the sense of having new flooring put down, you'd have a refurb survey of that area. Yeah. That would then identify whether there's asbestos present or not. If not, great. You can crack on. You don't need any controls in place, just normal controls for the workers. Yeah, and an important point to, to make for that is, is making clear what extent you expect it to go to because, like I said, previously it's having that scope of works and um if if the floors are unlevel or or what what the scope of what how deep do they need to go because there may be layers of screen yes layers um, of screen and layers layers of flooring and exactly vinyl and everything yeah and it's important to get to that because sometimes you know it's not bothered we'll just lift the carpet up and then we'll screed over it um, but that's not enough if you're you're going to be lifting it up we still need to know what exactly goes Right down to the actual base yeah. level. Yeah. What What are you planning? What's going back? Yes. What's the kind yeah. of the end goal for you, um, and what you're doing? So yeah, if if asbestos is identified, what what do you actually have to do? Well, HC say there's essentially two things. One, first and foremost, you've got to pre- prevent exposure to asbestos. It's an obvious one, right? Yeah. Don't want anybody exposed to yeah. asbestos. That's essentially what all, all the asbestos regulations uh, to do. Yeah. And number two, where where not practicable, you've got to reduce exposure as low as reasonably practicable by having everything in place, such as control measures, management systems, etc. But yeah. what does that actually mean? Well, first off, anyone working on asbestos materials, they've got to be trained and supervised. Yeah. So that is category B training for work on non-licensed materials. Yeah. So standard floor fitter, have they got that training? Exactly. They just don't. They wouldn't because that they're a flooring contractor. They do they fit floors. They remove old normal floors, but they don't do asbestos. That's the thing. That's why that training is there and that's yeah. why there's companies set up that literally solely do flooring, yeah. which is asbestos. Yeah. They obviously they should have asbestos awareness training, but to work with asbestos they need to have their little non license. Yeah, that's a good point. They definitely should have awareness. Um but yeah, no, it's different. And and that's the thing. Just because you've got that awareness, it doesn't allow you to work on asbestos. Exactly. That was my point. Yeah. And uh, I think, again, people get confused over that of, 
Well, no, I'm aware I can crack on and do my job. If I come across something, I know, I know to stop. Yeah. And it's like, well, no, that's – if you're heading into a project to work on something where there already is that risk, albeit a low risk, mm-hmm. um, it still is asbestos works. And to do those works, you need that Category B training. Yeah. So other things you need in place, uh, a plan of work. What do we mean by a plan of work? Yeah, so it's, it's basically um, a document that sets out how you're going to basically undertake the works. Yeah. Um, and that should include stuff. So it should have site details. Um, it should have a morphology of how you're going to safely remove the, uh, the asbestos material safely. Yeah. Um, it should have uh, details of what to do in an emergency. Mm-hmm. It should have details of um, how are you going to bag up the asbestos waste, how are you going to transport it to the waste container or the, uh, the waste vehicle. You should have all these things in place. What, what sort of PPE are you going to be wearing? Um, what's, the, what's the exposure, likely exposure of the asbestos materials? That yeah. should be recorded in the plan of work as well. Definitely. And to, to kind of back up your plan of work, it needs to come from a place of proven capability. Yes. So you, you've proven that this method works. Yeah. Um, and like you're saying, like about exposure, um, a, a way to prove that exposure uh, hasn't occurred and your method is working is by having background air tests and personal air tests on the guys actually doing the removals. Yeah. Because then you you can actually categorically, scientifically prove that the way that you're removing those floor tiles by spraying them down, using hand scrapers, etc isn't generating dust and debris that is spreading asbestos. Because that's, again, that's one of the ultimate things that the asbestos regs are in place for to prevent the uh, spread of asbestos. Yeah. So, uh, and oh, well, that's what I was going to say as well. A plan of work. And another thing on it, um, sometimes they're referred to as method statements mm-hmm. as well. So if you've heard that terminology, they're kind of interchangeable as such that in the regulations it talks about a plan of work, not a method statement. Yeah. But on site, generally speaking, lads will talk about oh you got a method for that i need a method statement yeah that kind of thing so if you've heard those terms they're kind of interchangeable so yeah another thing that accompanies the plan of work are risk assessments yeah and it's not just risk assessments of the asbestos which is a big one yeah that's well that's a legal requirement yeah. um you know it's a legal requirement to actually undertake a risk assessment on uh, the asbestos works and the likely exposure during those works but they also should cover other things off like i don't know manual handling yeah which is a big one for these types of works oh massively when you're talking you know it's back breaking work yeah 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 capitals yeah you get a room of capitals weighs a ton yeah and um, so yeah there's there's a lot of manual handling on, on these types of works yeah use of tools as well and equipment yeah. sharp blades you might have yeah um, sharps um yeah definitely a lot of tools and, it, and obviously if you've got any mechanical tools yes. as well and um, you obviously need the risk assessments and stuff for that and also with that, you need the training in place. Of It's not just a case of just pop to the hire shop, pick up a Kango, <laughs> come and crack on. Yes. Because again, a, a Kango, I mean, when that's going at full pelt, it's it's loud. Yeah. So that presents its own risk. Yeah, noise. They're, they're bloody dangerous. And if you don't put the, the shaft into the machine properly, it can uh, that can cause its own risks and problems as well. Yeah, and, and especially if you've got like a, a plate on the bottom, if you, if you go at the wrong angle, that can snap and... All sorts of problems. Yeah. So another one, another biggie, and again, this is always overlooked. Yes, this is always falling down and forgotten about, isn't it? If you think you've got everything else in place and you're good, I guarantee you haven't got insurance in place. Yeah. Is is the contractor undertaking his works insured to work with asbestos? And how many clients actually ask us, Mm. as asbestos professionals, to see our insurances? Are you insured? Yeah. We rarely get it, apart from... If somebody's got a stringent getting yeah, on their book yeah, policy it's or a, a tender. Procurement processes usually picks that up. Yeah. But if it's a straight costing I've got quotes, this job. Yeah. Can you help? Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. And the problem with insurance is that every insurance policy out there will formally exclude asbestos. And it'll exclude work with asbestos. So yeah. if your contractors are coming to your site to do flooring removals, yeah. I guarantee their insurances state um, asbestos works are excluded. Yeah, and the reason insurers do that is it, that they're insuring against themselves, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, they um, they know that when asbestos goes wrong, it goes wrong in a big way, and it costs a hell of a lot of money. So that's why they always categorically remove asbestos from the insurance schedule. So that's a big one to look out for. 
it's what kind of stuff that the, the, the guys in and octaves need to have personally. Face mask. Yeah, that's that's a biggie. Um, yeah. But not again, not just any old face mask. It needs to be a P3 respirator. Yeah. P3 is the the particle filter size that it filters down to. But equally as important than that, and if not more important than the actual mask itself, it's does it fit correctly? Exactly that. So, There's no point having the best mask in the world if it doesn't fit you right. No, you need the octaves need to be face fit tested. Yeah. And what that does is it identifies that their face fits that mask and therefore the filtration from the P3 is actually going to work. Yeah, it's giving you the adequate protection. Yeah. And again, this is another a biggie where non-asbestos contractors won't have this in place. No, they won't. And also on that as well, the asbestos workers go to work clean shaven every day. Yeah. Because... To wear the mask appropriately, you mm-hmm. need to be clean shaven. Yeah. A lot of trades just go to work with a bit of stubble yeah. or a beard or whatever. Yeah. Because they don't have to shave. Yes. Um, and again, that that could be where the the face fit and the respirator fails because if you're putting a respirator on and you're not cleanly shaven, uh, <clears throat> it's not going to fit properly and you will get exposed to asbestos. Yeah. This isn't just uh, an asbestos related um, thing that you need to have, is it? It's, no. If you wear a respirator for any occasion, you yeah. have to be suitably face fit tested. Yeah. So, you know, if you're a chippy doing dusty works and your employer is giving you a respirator, they need to evidence that it's, it's for you. Yeah, fit for purpose, fit for you. Yeah. It actually fits. Does your face fit? Yeah. <laughs> um, other stuff, the correct PPE, so coveralls. Gloves, eyewear, boots, everything like that needs to be in place. And it's all got to be the right grade. Yeah. And boots is an interesting one as well. It's because with asbestos, it needs to be a suitable footwear that you can decontaminate. Yes. Um, so laces. Yeah, um, laces are a no-no. A no-no. You can't decontaminate those, um, which is, you know, again, a standard contractor. That's just standard is workwear. Not, is not going to be thinking about these, these types of things. No, definitely not. And then other things, again, equipment that you're going to need. So Yeah, it's really important. Type H vacuum cleaner. It's probably that, you know, that is the minimum, really, that you'd expect to see yeah. on any asbestos work 100%. job. Yeah, a project should never go ahead with asbestos unless you've got a yeah. Type H. How, not... how can you remove dust and debris no. without a H type vacuum uh, cleaner? And I'm not talking about Henry. <laughs> <laughs> Although it does look similar, though, sometimes, don't they? Do, yeah, little Henry or Henrietta Hoover. No, they're um, Type H vacuums and they've got a HEPA filter, H-E-P-A, which stands for High Efficiency Particle Arrester. And what that means is, again, similarly to the, the, the respirator, the operatives wear, it filters out down to a certain size. And that is what the HEPA filter does. But again, you can't just have one um, sitting in the back of the van and every once every six months, once every nine months, like, oh, go and get the age side. Yeah. Because, again, because it's an important piece of equipment, it needs to be tested regularly every yeah. six months. has to go for a DOP test. Um, DOP stands for dispersed all particulate. And, again, that's to do with the, the pore size that it is filtering and is the filtration system working properly. So you need to have not only the equipment, but you need to have it in service yeah. as well. Yeah, and tested. That's usually every six months, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um, waste sacks, again, asbestos waste sacks are a certain type, a certain thickness. It's not just rubble sacks or anything like that. They've got to be the, the right size, the right thickness. They need to have the right UN marking identifiers on there of what asbestos materials are in there. Yeah, suppression yeah. equipment. Yeah, suppression equipment, um, the, the sprayers, the handheld sprayers that are used to, with the actual surfactant in it. Yeah. Again, it, it looks like the, the operatives just spray it down with water. They don't spray it with water. There's a, a solution that's called surfactant that goes into uh, the handheld sprayers, and it is watered down, but then that surfactant is sprayed onto the materials before and during the removal process. And again, what that does is that keeps the fibre level down to the, the very minimum um, because if there are any fibres that are thinking about escaping, yeah. well, another operative is usually by the operative doing the removal, spraying that down with um, surfactant. And then finally, I think this is probably the last thing that um, the operatives need in place that, again, a, a normal standard contractor won't have, which is a waste carrier's licence. Yeah. Yeah. And a vehicle that can actually carry the waste. Yes. Because uh, 
one thing is to get the waste carrier's licence, which is a fairly straightforward process. Yeah, it's you, quite you, simple, simple form to fill in yeah. with the uh, environment agency. Exactly. You just literally register the vehicle and what you're intending to, to transport and all the rest of it. However, the next thing is, have you got the right vehicle? And it needs to have uh, be compartmentalised. So between the cab and the actual waste carrying area, that needs to be compartmentalised. And also, if you're carrying waste in that vehicle, you can't have anything else in there. So again, you've, you, you're then looking at having two vans, one to do the waste, one to carry all your plant and equipment, because that can't sit within that waste area. Because when you're moving along, if one of the bags gets punctured or something like that, then essentially all of your working tools are now considered contaminated. Yeah, There is a way around that, obviously, with contractors can um, employ you know, a separate contractor to obviously maybe do a, a waste pickup or yeah. they could get a hazardous waste container delivered to site that way that's kind of a, a workaround on that but either way whoever's disposed of the waste has to be you know verified that they have got their the correct licenses to to undertake that mm. and, and with that i mean like we going back to the beginning when we said non-asbestos carpet tiles onto the asbestos well when we're talking about the waste it all goes as contaminated waste yes because like we said right at the beginning generally speaking it's always stuck down there's sections that are stuck down and when you remove them, you can look on the back of the, the carpet and you can see sections of vinyl, sections of bitumen all stuck on. And even when you can't see it, it's still been glued onto an asbestos item. So when that waste has got rid of, everything goes as contaminated waste. Yeah, which a lot of people don't think about. No. On the client side or anyone procuring the work. No, exactly. It's kind of it's the twofold thing, and that's the problem. It's is the procurers don't consider it and the contractors don't consider it an issue when in reality it really is an issue and that's what makes it not non-asbestos works, it makes it non-licensed asbestos yeah, works. Yeah, it, whichever way you look at it, you're working on asbestos material and therefore it's deemed as asbestos works. Yeah, exactly, because yeah, you kind of need to forget about that the carpet sitting on top isn't asbestos. Yeah. You kind of need to forget that because it's that thing that's directly underneath it is asbestos stuck it's not just underneath it it's stuck to it yeah exactly that and that's why doing work such as that will always be non-licensed and you need to have all of those things in place yeah all right i hope you enjoyed that one remember asbestos first not last